Well, good morning. It is great to be here to worship with you all today, and uh, we've already enjoyed so much this morning, meeting some of you and, um, and having a chance to, uh, to enter into your services, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's been good to get to know your pastor a little bit in the last few months, and uh, uh, come to uh, not, not see some familiar faces out there, some, some of the men that were at the dinner back in March, I think it was. And I had a chance to come and share with, um, with the men's ministry. Really enjoyed that evening. Uh, but uh, thanks for having me back. I didn't know if you'd let me come back or not after, after that. But um, what good relationship we've already started here with, with Faith Community. And, and we really appreciate you taking the time to, um, to have some interest in, in our ministry and what we're doing. And uh, glad to, to share some of that with you today. Wanted you to see my best half. So she's up here beside me, and uh, really want um, to emphasize that we are really a team when we get into the halls of Annapolis. Tracy uh, comes with me uh, many times when we're uh, visiting folks, and, and she's in on our uh, Bible study time that we do on Thursday mornings during the 90-day during the session, which just ended here a few weeks ago. And you know, you wouldn't think that it would be so strange, but when we're going down the hallway and we're popping in and out of these offices, it's amazing how many people in our world don't see marriages where people get along. <laughs> it's a little bizarre for them. It's not something necessarily that they've had modeled or something that they're even experiencing themselves. So when a married couple comes in and they are laughing and they're enjoying being with each other and they're holding hands walking down the hallway, it's, it's weird <laughs> for a lot of these folks just to see that and gets attention immediately. And uh, Tracy especially has a very uh, important ministry to a lot of the ladies who are in uh, the uh, capital community. Uh, aides, and especially some of these younger ladies who are uh, engaged or newly married, and uh, they, you know, they they see they they see a couple of people that are that are serving the Lord together and enjoy being with each other, and uh, they really like to see Tracy coming down the hall, and uh, and they may share things with her that they wouldn't necessarily share with me, so it's really good that we can uh, we can be together for, um, for uh, a, a broader exposure that, that folks can have to the ministry, and Tracy uh, just does a great job with that. She's never met a stranger. She does a lot better, actually, with, uh, with uh, the personal communication than, than I do, and just really enjoy having her there and appreciate Tracy have, being alongside me. Do you want to say anything to the, to the folks? Sure. Okay. Um, just a little background on us. Brent was uh, born in Charleston, West Virginia. I'm from the Eastern Panhandle, and we met together in college, and we were, um, he was an upperclassman and a great musician, and I wasn't, but I ended up taking handbells, just ringing handbells, and I didn't know it, but the teacher put me in between Brent and his ex-girlfriend, and uh, so we had a ball, <laughs> And she didn't, um, <laughs> but uh, we got married in 1989, and we lived around the country, and God called us to go back to my hometown, and I was able to take care of my parents before their death, and then um, the Lord actually took a conversation. A lady asked me, she said, would you ever adopt? And I said, well, if the Lord allowed it, but I don't know that how we could ever afford it and those kind of questions. And she put our names down on a three by five card and gave it to another lady. And she said on the card, she said, he's a pastor and they're musicians. And so a young girl, 19 years old, she had two requests for uh, birth parents that they be religious and they'd be musicians. And everybody had these portfolios, and we had a three-by-five card. And I didn't know, the lady 
wrote it down on the three by five card. So she came up to me at a conference and she said, you have three hours to decide if you want a baby. Now, <laughs> what? So God has just led amazingly in our lives. Five years ago, Brent got an infection in one of his legs, a horrible infection, almost took his life, and it did take um, his leg. So he is an amputee, and you probably didn't notice, um, except maybe a few walk steps, but he does very well at the Capitol walking the halls, and we praise God for that. Three years ago, I was teaching first grade, and I fell down a couple steps, and I'm going to hold the handrail when I go back down. But um, I had a traumatic brain injury, and um, the doctor said that I was 10 minutes from death. And if I had gone back to my classroom, I would have died in front of my little kids. So I uh, praise God for that. Um, I had seizures, and um, I had to learn to talk and walk again. I was in rehab, and... So three years ago, I just, I can't believe it's only been that short of a time and that I get to still praise the Lord. And I'm one year seizure free. So praise the Lord this month. Thanks, well, thank you, sweetie. All that to say that um, God's good and not a thing that we go through that is wasted for his glory and we want to give praise to him today for all that uh, that he has accomplished i've got a uh, <laughs> i've got a great what would she be she, a, a great niece who is a she's two or three now and she saw the medal on my leg back uh, when we had a family get together at, at easter and she's fascinated you know by the leg and uh, so she wanted to know what was going on, and I took it off, you know, showed her. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if she really knew what to think about that, and, and uh, she said, well, where did you get that? I said, well, from the doctor. And she said, I went to the doctor, and all I got was a flu shot. <laughs> um, I don't know if she wants to go back to the doctor anymore after, uh, after, after seeing that. <laughs> but God is good, and, uh, you know, we, we did start this ministry, uh, joined Capital Commission back in uh, 2007, actually full-time started in 2008, and um, we've just had to, you know, roll with the changes that have come during life, like everybody does, and modify things, and and God has, uh, God has been very good to us to uh, be able to continue to do what, we, um, what we're called to do. There are uh, colleagues that I have doing this same type of ministry in 25 other state capitals. And so uh, the Lord is growing our group and having intentional Bible teachers in state capitals that are reaching folks for Christ and pointing people not to political solutions but to the Lord. We believe that uh, society will change as hearts are changed and that all politics can do is change things on the outside. But the gospel changes us from the inside out. And these are elected officials and staffers that are going to stand before the Lord someday. And we as a church need to understand that. And we need to uh, take seriously the biblical mandate to pray for our leaders and to take the truth of God's word to them. So thanks for letting us share our, our, our ministry with you today. We've got a literature table out in the foyer if you want to stop by there and get, get a, f a few more details about what we do. Uh, there's a brochure back there, a prayer card. There's a, uh, a little magnet that has uh, the URL for a website you can go to that will be a reminder to you to pray for your leaders, uh, specifically uh, in, in Maryland. And actually, you could sign up for any state, but you can, um, you can get a reminder about, uh, for your leaders in Maryland uh, through that site. And um, what else is back there? You can also sign up. Uh, some of you may have done this back uh, when, when I met with the men's ministry, but uh, sign up back there if you want to get our, uh, our email updates that come every four to six weeks, and we'll keep you in the loop with, with what we're doing in Annapolis and around the state. In Annapolis, mainly during those 90 days during the session, but now we're meeting with uh, legislators through the state in their districts and trying to keep up with them 
especially now during a very busy campaign year. Anytime I go and speak in a church around the state, I uh, usually send out a few emails to the legislators from that district and invite them to come. Just let them know that I'll be in their neck of the woods and that, uh, that we'd like to have them uh, come and, and take part in the services. And I did that again this time, and we have a Maryland state delegate that's here in, in the room right now. So I uh, answered the invitation. I was really glad that he was able to make it, but Mike Malone is over here on this side. There's Delegate Malone. Thank you. We're really glad you're here, and uh, thank you for serving. We appreciate it very much. I don't know who did this. But somebody did the math and sat down and, and decided where the middle of the Bible was. The same number of chapters on one side, same number of chapters on the other side, and right in the middle, it actually ends up being Psalm 118 is the chapter. And the verse is right in the middle of that chapter. It's like verse 8 or 9, but it just seems interesting to me that the middle verse in the Bible, according to this person, says this, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. So what do you do about government? Actually, the Bible has a lot to tell us about how we are to uh, have a posture with human government. Now, when you get together with your families, what are the two things you want to make sure you never talk about? Religion and politics. Got to stay away from those. And uh, it's hard to do sometimes because uh, so much of our lives are, are wrapped up in those, in those two main areas. But the Bible does have a lot to say about our relationship to human authority. And in these verses today, if you turn to Romans 13, we'll take a look at this paragraph that begins that chapter. And really, uh, each of these principles that we're going to look at today could be a sermon in itself. But we, uh, we want to uh, try to, to take this as a, as a group of verses, these first seven verses. And um, such important truth that's here in this, uh, in this section of Scripture. So we're in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. And the first principle is just in the very first, in the very first um, phrase says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. So right off the bat, we have the response that we should have to our government, and that is our submission. You ever noticed in the Christian life that things are really backwards? From the things that we want to naturally do, we have so many things in Scripture. We spend our whole life trying to learn and understand how to change our thinking into a biblical way of thinking. If someone persecutes you, bless them. If you have an enemy, love them. If you go through trials, be joyful. If you want to be great, Serve somebody. If you want to save your life, lose it. I think this phrase that we're dealing with right off the bat in Romans 13 is kind of the same idea. It's not a natural, a natural inclination that we have to want to submit ourselves to government or really any other authority. Have you noticed that? Any authority that we have over us, we have trouble being told what to do. That's just not built in to us. But here Paul makes a blanket statement that we may not always want to hear. Whoever you are, in whatever time period, in whatever governmental system you find yourself, no matter how mad or discouraged it makes you, submit to your government. Some of you have been in the military. Some of you are in the military now. This, this word for submit is something you would understand. It basically means to, uh, to arrange underneath. It's a military term. General, colonel, major, captain, and on down. Each 
person understanding what their role is in that chain of command. Why don't we want to hear that phrase, be subject, submit yourself to your government? I mean, Lord, you know I want to obey you, and I understand that you're telling me to submit, but have you seen the decisions these people are making? I mean, have you seen my tax return? I mean, I know God's everywhere, but really, have you been in the line at DMV lately? And that road, do you really expect me to go 25 through there? It's impossible. Peter also wrote about this idea in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise to those who do good. So one reason we're commanded to obey human leaders, says here for, in First Peter 2, is for the Lord's sake. Not because we always agree, not because rulers will always be moral and nice, but because in submitting to government we're actually submitting to God. He is the one who has placed that authority there above us. That same passage goes on to say, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God Honor the emperor. The world is watching the way that we are, as Christians, submitting or not submitting to our government. Christians in Peter's day were causing quite a stir because they were rebelling against the one who wanted their allegiance, and that was Caesar. But they knew that King Jesus was the king of the kingdom that they were truly citizens of, their first citizenship. But they were also here on earth. So they had to find ways to submit, even though it was a difficult time to do that in the first century. Well, the next phrase says this, For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So the second principle they have here is that there needs to be a recognition of government and that its source is God himself. God is the one who has ordained government. Daniel 2 gives us this, uh, gives us this principle. He, God, changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God established government and he gave them their authority. You might remember the conversation that Jesus had with Pilate. Pilate did not understand this. Pilate thought he was the authority. Pilate thought that his authority came from himself. He said to Jesus, you're not going to talk to me? Don't you realize I have the authority to let you go or to crucify you? And what did Jesus tell him? You would have no authority over me unless it was given to you from above. And that's the way we need to look at our recognizing the government that is above us, is that its source comes from God. And while we're here on earth, we are answerable to that government. Now, obviously, there are reasons to have a problem with some of the decisions made by some of our leaders, but we should be thankful. You know, there are good laws. We should be thankful for those. When Tracy and I were driving over this morning, I'm kind of glad there's a law that you need to drive on the right side of the road. 
I felt safer because of that. Now that's here, you know, check whatever country you're in. You might not, you might get, might, might not be as safe. But that's good law. I'm glad we have that law. I'm glad there are standards and inspections for, for meat and for water and for air. I'm glad the government has laws against somebody breaking down my door and stealing my stuff, even though it may not care that the Eighth Commandment says do not steal. I'm glad that there are laws against perjury because it gives some cr credibility to our judicial system, but also even a government that really may not care that the Ninth Commandment says do not lie. It's good that we have these laws. So there are times where we just need to acknowledge, God, thank you that we do have a government that at times gets right and makes some good law. Now in America, we're told that we are a self-governing people, that our leaders get their authority from the consent of the governed. It's a very American idea. I'm glad we have the, re the, the, I'm glad we have the freedom to vote and we're going to have a chance to do that course this year. The primary is toward the end of June and uh, the general election in, in November. And we should participate in that. But God says it's not you, it's not me, who ultimately decides who will lead us. He is the one who places these folks into their positions and into their offices. He is the source. Well, let's keep going. We're all the way to verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So this pre the, the principle that we see here is, is what happens when we resist government. That can bring suffering. Now Paul writes that in a general sense, in a general sense, good behavior should be rewarded by those who lead in human government. And if you disobey, there are consequences for that. God established the authority, so disobeying that authority, we've got to be careful about that because God established that authority over us. By the way, this is one of the reasons in an election year like this we're in the middle of right now, we need to be careful and make sure that we know who we are voting for and that they are people who know the difference between right and wrong. So we need to be careful as we go to the ballot box that we've done some research, we've done some checking, some reading, and understand who it is that we are voting for. God's authority brings with it God's sanction to carry out punishment according to these verses. Police need to carry weapons and use force sometimes. And when that force is used in a proper way, it makes all of us safer. Now, it's no big secret that human governmental leaders will sometimes make terrible law that is against God's design. We've watched it in Maryland. We've watched it in the General Assembly where there are bills passed each year that celebrate immorality and injustice. And it's heartbreaking to watch in our own society where sin is embraced and normalized and justified. But God is not in less control now than he was before. And we can take confidence that he is the one who is in control. While this text tells us to submit, we know from all of Scripture that there are times when we can't do what the government tells us to do. You can probably think of some of these examples yourself. Exodus chapter 1, there were some Hebrew midwives that were told by the Egyptians to kill Jewish babies, and they refused to do it. Daniel was told by Babylonian decree not to pray. Well, he knew he couldn't stop praying. 
he was committed to his king, right? And he continued to pray. His friends, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, refused to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. And they had to face the consequences for that. So civil disobedience is allowed, it's rare, but it's allowed when rulers force Christians to disobey God. There's a really good example of that in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John are told, don't preach. This whole thing about Christ, you're, you're, you're creating too much of a, uh, of, a, of a stir. You need to stop that. Can you imagine telling these two apostles, you, you got to quit that. you got to quit preaching. And in the middle of Acts 4, Peter stands up and he says, look, we can't help but speak about the things we've seen. Whether it's good to obey you or obey God, you judge. But we, we, we're not going to stop. And they go back to the church, Peter and John. And they tell the church what happened. And there is a prayer in the, medi, in the middle of Acts chapter 4. I encourage you to read it sometime. It's a fascinating prayer. But there's some verses in there that are very instructive in the way we ought to be looking at human government. They said this in part of that prayer. For truly in this city... There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats, the current leaders, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. In other words, we will obey you, God not our government. And if they try to keep us from preaching the gospel, we'll stay true to what you have revealed. If that means a beating, that's what it means. If that means jail time, that's what it means. But we're ready. We cannot disobey you. Verse 28 is very key, though. It says that godless leaders like Herod and Pilate did whatever God's hand and God's plan had predestined to take place. He used ungodly leaders to carry out his plan. And we've got to warm up to that idea. We may not agree with who's in office, but if God is the one who has placed them there, we've got to warm up to the idea that God has a purpose and he may carry that out in ways we don't understand. We have to be salt and light in this world. That's what we're called to do. Submitting to them but ready to choose obeying God over man if we have to and accept the consequences for that. Let me just say, especially in the church, the trajectory of where things are headed morally in our country, there will be no fence to sit on with some of these issues. And we'll have to let people know who we're going to obey. I don't know what the consequences are for that down the road. But we need to prepare now to make that choice and stand with what the scriptures t teach us or go with the flow of our culture. But it can't be a middle road. Verse 5, let's finish the, uh, the paragraph here. Therefore, one must be in subjection. There it is again, same word. Not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. So the final thing that we see here is that we, we do need to respect our governments right here in this passage. Why? Because they're called right here God's servant, God's ministers. It's the same word we use in the church here for deacon. They serve. Our government serves God. They don't always please God, but they carry out His will. His will may be to bless a nation because the leaders please Him. His will may be to 
judge a nation because he is rejected. Either way, he calls government his ministers, his servants. 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you jot down that reference and look it up sometime, the first four verses of that chapter, very key to the ministry that we have in, uh, in Capital Commission across the nation. 1 Timothy 2, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and those who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You know, we're blessed in America to have the kind of access we have to our leaders. We do go to voting booths. We do choose them. But even after that, we've got access to them to let our voices be heard, to contact them, to have a voice on legislation, to testify in hearings and so forth. And we should be participants in the process. But there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. I was very sad to hear from so many aides in Annapolis, I don't know how many years ago this was now, probably 2014, when the bill for same-sex marriage was making its way through the General Assembly. And what I was hearing from aid after aid after aid, and from some legislators too, was just the hateful calls and emails that they were getting in their offices from Christians, people who made sure to tell them that they were Christians. Completely disrespectful to those who led them. And sometimes in our zeal to be aggressive and speak out for righteousness, I think what can happen is We give ourselves a little license to be disrespectful. These people work for us, after all, right? We can get in their face. Not according to these verses. There is a respect. We need to watch those Facebook posts. We need to watch what we say in casual conversations to our kids and to our coworkers. But especially when we directly contact these folks in their offices, there are still people today that won't give me the time of day when I come to share the gospel with them because of those nasty emails they got four years ago. Well, let's recap. These are our four principles that we see from these verses. Our response to government is our submission, recognition of government, its source is from God. And resisting government can bring suffering. And respecting government because it is God's minister, it's God's servant for our good. There are just huge implications for us in this first paragraph, Romans 13, that should affect our attitudes, our discussions with people, our voting paying our taxes, our thoughts while watching the news, our prayer life. It affects a lot of things, these verses. So it's okay giving you permission to talk about religion and politics, okay? It's all right. Paul did, Jesus did, and we need to let the world around us know where we stand, that we are citizens of another kingdom, but while we're here as citizens in this world, we will handle ourselves as our king, our ultimate king, has told us to. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the guidance that you give us through your word. We're grateful for uh, such a clear blueprint, how to think and act and apply these verses. Lord, I thank you for this Bible teaching, Bible believing church, a missions minded church that is a light 
in this community and around the world. Pray you continue to bless them. Thank you for Pastor Kevin, his leadership, the other leaders here, that you would um, continue to use them, keep them close to you. And uh, Father, we want to please you in all that we do, even while we're in this world, but not of it. In Christ's name we pray, amen.